Facebook has decided to keep former President Trump off of its platform for now. Senator Ted Cruz tweeted the following, for every liberal celebrating Trump's social media ban, if the big tech oligarchs can muzzle the former president, what's to stop them from silencing you? What do you make of that comment? Does he have a point? Well, let me first say that um, this is an independent board's decision, uh, and uh, we're not going to have any comment on the future of the former president's social media. So his view is that there's more that needs to be done to ensure that this type of misinformation, disinformation, damaging, sometimes life-threatening information is not going out to the American public. You're saying more that needs to be done. Are there any concerns, though, about uh, First Amendment rights? And where does the White House draw the line on that? Well, look, I think we are, of course, a believer in First Amendment rights. Uh, yesterday, you said that the CDC engaged with around 50 stakeholders when coming up with these guidelines for reopening yeah. schools. So in addition to the teachers union, the American Federation of Teachers, who are these other roughly 50 stakeholders? Well, let me give you, I'm not going to read all 50, because you know, but and I'm happy to send them to you after. Um, but just as an example, while I find this lengthy list, um, you know, they include the YMCA. Can you just explain maybe just a little bit more, you know, why the CDC needs all of this input from so many outside entities? Why can't it just come up with these science-based guidelines on its own? Well, they do so sh to ensure that the recommendations are feasible to implement and that they adequately address the safety and well-being of individuals the guidance is aimed to protect. And that type of consultation is pretty standard. Now there is a huge Chinese rocket in outer space that's going to be crashing down to Earth likely on Saturday, and nobody knows exactly where. It'll likely be in an ocean, but it could, or pieces of it could come down over a populated area, and this isn't the first time that China has allowed, knowingly allowed, something like this to happen. So does the White House condemn this kind of repeated reckless behavior from China's space program? Well, let me first say that U.S. Space Command is aware of and tracking the location of the Chinese Long March 5. Cooperation is a hallmark of our approach. We're going to work with our international partners. If this rocket does cause some, some serious damages here on Earth, would the White House enforce China paying some sort of compensation as required by the U.N. Liability, space Liability Convention? Well, um, again, I, I think we'd, have, of course, uh, refer to the advice and uh, guidance from U.S. Space Command and Department of Defense and others, uh, but... Any names or any, anyone on the consideration? No names to float out there for you. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some more ambassadors soon to Wait. announce. When you say soon, will that be before or after he makes his decision on going to the Olympics? <laughs> I can't order for you, Hans. There's just so much excitement to stay tuned for around here. So we'll see. The math, though, this puts police reform in some regard ahead of the negotiations, one would think, for the American Families Plan, the infrastructure plan, which he set an end of the summer deadline for. Is this now the president's top priority? Does he want Congress to tackle this first? Well, I would say that the president believes uh, Congress can and should move forward with multiple uh, policies at the same time. Uh, go ahead, Kristen. I'm Kristen. Kristen, Kristen, I got confused. Caitlin, there's a lot of K's. It's a Wednesday. Go ahead, Caitlin. Right. Kristen and I also have been dressing a lot lately, so it's fine. <laughs> Kristen has a very good mask on today. This Kristen, both of your masks. Go ahead, okay. My question is on these restaurant funds. Yes. When will they start being awarded, and does the president envision having to ask Congress for more money for this? Well, on the second piece, um, well, first, the first awards as part of the pilot program will be funded Friday. So we're this program, not the pilot, the, the, sec the actual part of it, not the pilot. Well, those who applied this week uh, can expect up to uh, up to 14 days on average from submission to funding. So it'll be a very rapid turnaround. OK, and does he envision asking Congress for more money for this? When Congress comes back, we are happy to discuss the best ways to further support small businesses, including restaurants hurt by the crisis. So he's certainly open to that. There's a new evaluation of the American Families Plan out by the Penn Wharton Budget Model. Mm -hmm. And they found, actually, that the plan would increase the deficit and fail to grow the economy as much as President Biden has claimed. And so is, is there a risk in the long term that the president might not be able to fully deliver on what he's promised economically? Well, first, let me say we strongly agree, disagree with the analysis, as do other independent uh, experts. 
according to anal an analysis out this week from Moody's, GDP in 2030 will be more than $700 billion higher than it would be without the Jobs and uh, Family, the Jobs Act, uh, the Jobs Plan, and the Families Plan. This is in large part because labor force participation will be nearly a full percentage point higher due to the effects of the benefits of child care, su child support, child care support, and paid family leave. I get that you sort of prefer the Moody's model over the Penn Wharton. I'm just curious if the White House is going to accept whatever CBO and JCT scores the president's proposals are. Well, I think our issue with the Penn Wharton model was the data it was based on and that it was off. Uh, and so we'll have to look at what the data uh, that any future analysis is based on, and then we'll give an assessment. Okay, so even official, you're not embracing whatever the official assessment will be from CBO and JCT? Well, Hans, there is no assessment at this point in time. Our assumption is that they would be abiding by accurate data, so we'll look forward to seeing those assessments. And when do you expect those assumptions and data to come in? I don't have a prediction of that. Thank you. I suggest you ask them. And my question on the patents, you were talking about how the president last summer expressed his favor for waiving these so countries would be able to mass produce these vaccines once they're ready. Of course, that was when they were not ready yet last summer. Yeah. So just to be clear, is that still his position? That has been that has been his position. He also believes that there needs to be an internal policy process. That's what's been ongoing. Given what he's heard from the policy teams, from the health experts, people like Dr. Fauci have weighed in publicly about whether this would be helpful mm -hmm. in making vaccines right now or if that would be further down the road, but is, is his position still what he said last summer, which is absolutely positively, he will ensure there are no patents standing in the way of other countries and companies mass producing these life-saving vaccines? That has been his position, but he is the president of the United States who believes in the advice, the counsel, the considerations of his policy teams. My favorite topic of the WTO. Well, I don't know which one it is. Waiver. Okay. <laughs> Waiver. So this morning there was a meeting at the WTO. Catherine Tai made some comments during an FT session talking about, you know, time being of the essence, really sort of underscoring. There are multiple reports out also about kind of a division within the administration on this waiver issue. Can you just really walk us through what your perspective is on this and why? So that there are so many people in, in, in institutions and organizations now really putting pressure on President Biden to back this waiver. Well, one, I think it's important first to just take a step back and remind everyone that President, uh, the President spoke about his support uh, for uh, this type of a waiver back during the campaign. Uh, but it, it, we are running a process. We have been running a process uh, in the administration uh, that includes all stakeholders in the administration. and. I'll just note my first campaign was for the secretary's um, gubernatorial race in 2002, so full circle. A um, couple of items, additional items for all of you at the top. Uh, this afternoon, uh, President Biden, as you know, will deliver remarks on Amer the American Rescue Plan's Restaurant Revitalization Fund, the administration's program to provide relief to restaurants, bars, food trucks, and other food and drink establishments. As we all know, restaurants were some of the first and worst hit businesses in the pandemic. The Restaurant Revitalization Fund provides $28.6 billion in direct relief to restaurants and food and beverage establishments and prioritizes those that are women-owned, veteran-owned, and owned by other socially and economically disadvantaged individuals by only funding applications from these businesses for the first 21 days of the program. Then it expands beyond there. Uh, earlier today, the president also visited one local restaurant that was a beneficiary of relief funding through the Revitalization Fund's pilot program. Uh, Taqueria Jimelas, I'm going to butcher that and I apologize, I want to go there and have some tacos, um, is owned in part by Mexican immigrants and during the pandemic went from 55 employees to just seven. So clearly uh, in great need. These funds will allow business owners to complete uh, delayed projects, rehire and raise the wages of their staff, pay their rent and operate with confidence again. Uh, applications for the program opens up on Monday and in just the first two days of the program, 186,200 restaurants, bars, and other eligible businesses in all 50 states, Washington, D.C., and five U.S. territories.
territories applied for relief. 97,600 applications came from restaurants, bars, and other eligible businesses owned and controlled by women, veterans, socially and economically disadvantaged individuals, or some combination of the three. 61,700 applications came from businesses with under $500,000 in annual pre-pandemic revenue, representing some of the smallest restaurants and bars and businesses uh, in America. Um, and uh, we uh, look forward to implementing that program. Uh, with that, I think we can go, Alex, to you. Questions? Uh, so the CDC's summer camp guidance is very strict, as Dr. Fauci acknowledged today. It requires even adults who have been vaccinated to wear masks outside at all times. It requires uh, children to be socially distanced. Um, can you explain why that contradicts uh, the administration's guidance that vaccinated uh, adults don't have to wear masks outside? And also, Dr. Fauci suggested that it may change as the science becomes clearer. But are, is the administration at all concerned that there won't be compliance with something this strict and there won't be compliance if it continuously changes? Sure. Well, first, I think everyone can expect that the guidance will continue to be updated and will continue to change. And I think as a parent myself of kids going to summer school, some, not summer school, summer camp, don't tell them I said that, um, you know, they, uh, I would welcome that. Uh, and there's no question what the CDC is trying to do is provide guidance to the American public, to parents, to families uh, that they can trust, that they know is reliable based on medical experts, doctors, based on data on how they can feel safe. The guidance that was, uh, re um, that was rolled out last week does not convey that when you're outside in a crowd, you cannot, you should not wear a mask. If you are outside and you're not in a crowd, then you, and you're vaccinated, you don't need to wear a mask. Uh, and obviously, uh, there is nuance in all of these applications, and people are still learning how to apply it. Uh, but as kids are dropping off, as parents, I should say, are dropping off their kids at summer camp, as there are tons of kids, tons of parents, uh, counselors, uh, you know, that certainly wouldn't uh, wouldn't be someone alone. But I think what Dr. Fauci was conveying, Alex, is that the data, they're going to continue to look at the data. And they want to put out updated guidance as they feel comfortable and confident in what they can provide to the American public. Sure. And there's a new evaluation of the American Families Plan out by the Penn Wharton Budget Model. And they found, actually, that the plan would increase the deficit and fail to grow the economy as much as President Biden has claimed. And so is, is there a risk in the long term that the president might not be able to fully deliver on what he's promised economically? Well, first, let me say we strongly agree, disagree with the analysis, as do other independent uh, experts. According to anal an analysis out this week from Moody's, GDP in 2030 will be more than $700 billion higher than it would be without the Jobs and uh, Family, the Jobs Act, uh, the Jobs Plan, and the Families Plan. This is in large part because labor force participation will be nearly a full percentage point higher due to the effects of the benefits of child care, su child support, child care support, and paid family leave. And that same analysis found that the economic benefits would only increase over time due to increased college enrollment and universal pre-K, which will help some of the two million women who are no longer in the workforce get back in. The Penn Mo Wharton model uh, analysis also off in a number of important ways. It gets the cost of the investments wrong by about $700 billion, even though our estimates come from career officials at OMB. Moody's, for example, arrived at deficits even lower than the administration, when it, than we had when it came to the effect of the family's plan. And of course, our plan would be implemented over a series of eight years and 10 years and paid for over 15. So we're going to rely on the majority of economic analysis out there and our own analysis in here. And we are confident we'll be able to reach both our job creation projections and, of course, um, do it in a way we can pay for it. And one international question. Um, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu missed the deadline to put together a coalition government yesterday or a new governing coalition, is, is the president monitoring the situation and does the administration have any sort of response or perspective on the possibility of a new coalition government there? Uh, well, we do read all of your news coverage, uh, but uh, we are not going to comment uh, publicly on government formation while that process is underway. Go ahead, Andrew. Okay, so I have a couple follow-ups on, on Bill Sachs' answer, Secretary Bill Sachs' answer mm -hmm. on the Twin Metals thing. Is that a decision that you think will be coming at any point soon, or is that just sort of carved out? 
I don't have a prediction of that. Um, I would say I would refer you to the Department of Agriculture, and they would, of course, be the right source for that information. We can see if there's more follow-up on it uh, on the timeline. Okay. And then um, on the issue of uh, the G7 meeting and the mm -hmm. subsequent meetings with uh, Putin, have you, do you have any news for us on that front um, in terms of timing and also the agenda? Not quite yet. Um, as soon as we have uh, details or any confirmed details of timing, location, date, participation, we will of course share that with you and I would expect we wouldn't have more specifics on an agenda if and when we have it confirmed until much closer. And then just one more on my favorite topic of the WTO. Well, I don't know which one it is. Okay. <laughs> Trips waiver. So mm -hmm. this morning there was a meeting of the WTO. Catherine Ty made some comments during an FT session talking about you know, time being of the essence, really, sort of underscoring. There are multiple reports out also about kind of a division within the administration on this waiver issue. Can you just really walk us through what your perspective is on this and why? So the, there are so many people in, in, in institutions and organizations now really putting pressure on President Biden to back this waiver. Well, I think it's important first to just take a step back and remind everyone that President, uh, the president spoke about his support uh, for uh, this type of a waiver back during the campaign. Uh, but it, it, we are running a process. We have been running a process uh, in the administration uh, that includes all stakeholders in the administration. And he is somebody who has welcomed people of different views. He wants to know the details. He's a details guy, and he wants to dig into the pros and cons and all of the considerations for any decision. Uh, as we look at this decision, what we're really talking about, I know you know this, Andrea, but for, for others, um, we're really talking about the U.S. position as it relates to the WTO process, right? And that process will take a series of months uh, and requires um, a uh, unanimous point of view to move forward. Uh, so what we are, the consideration now is the U.S. position. Our objective overall as we look at this decision is how can we provide as much supply in the most cost-effective way to the global community? And clearly there are steps we've announced. We've take, we're have we in the process of taking, uh, d providing uh, 60 million doses to the global community once we have that available. Uh, that are AstraZeneca doses. Earlier this week, Pfizer announced they'll also be sending doses or manufacturing doses for the global community. And we're going to continue to work with our partners. I expect we'll have more now that the WTO meetings are underway. We'll have more to say very soon on this. Are you concerned about setting a precedent that could be, so even if India and South Africa narrow their proposal, which is apparently something that's going on, and maybe you could ask, you could, you could confirm that that is your understanding. Mm -hmm. um, if, if, even if that proposal is narrowed, are you concerned that you're going to be setting a precedent that could harm U.S. companies in the future? Which is what, you know, we hear from U.S. industry. Well, clearly as these decisions are weighed, we take intellectual property incredibly seriously. Um, and uh, we also, though, are in the midst of a historic global pandemic, uh, which requires a range of uh, creative uh, solutions, um, and we're looking at it through that prism. It sounds, I'm sorry, Jen, I just want to be very clear. It sounds like you're pushing us or leaning toward some kind of a, 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 a waiver of some kind. I, I'm not trying to give you an indication. I, that obviously would be an announcement uh, or a decision that would be recommended by the uh, USTR, and a decision I would expect that would be made by the USTR. Uh, but what I'm trying to give you an understanding of, which I think was your question, is what the considerations are in the thinking. And decision. I think a decision will be made soon. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I have questions on a couple of different topics. The first is um, on the debt limit. Is the White House concerned about being able to avoid a government shutdown and raising the debt limit, considering the Treasury is unsure can you, how long it can use the extraordinary measures it has? Um, and what's the White House's strategy for pressuring Congress to agree to raise or suspend the debt limit, or are you leaving that to Treasury to figure out? 
Well, first, I will say that um, on the issue at hand, um, raising or suspending the debt ceiling does not authorize new spending. Sometimes I'm not saying you're confused about that. Some people sometimes are. Uh, it merely allows Treasury to meet obligations that Congress has already approved. So certainly they would be in the lead, as they have historically been in most administrations, on making that case. Uh, we expect uh, Congress to act in a timely manner to raise or suspend the debt ceiling, as they did three times on a broad bipartisan basis during the last administration, including the same year that the former president uh, signed into law tax cuts that uh, added uh, $2 trillion to the deficit. So uh, we certainly expect they will move forward, uh, that this is something that has been done on a bipartisan basis. Democrats and Republicans have called for it in the past, and uh, that's what we'll be advocating for. Um, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell said this morning, um, when asked about kind of the issues within his own party, um, that, quote, 100 percent of my focus is on stopping this new administration. Um, and he touted kind of the, the unity within his caucus from Susan Collins to Ted Cruz. Um, are you concerned that it will be difficult to work with Republicans when you're when you have these kind of statements coming from their leader? Well, I guess the contrast for people to consider is 100 percent of our focus is on delivering relief to the American people on getting the pandemic under control and putting people back to work. And we welcome support, engagement, and work with the Republicans on that. And there's the president has extended an open arm to that. The door to the Oval Office is open. He's invited Senator Capito to bring a group of her choosing to the White House next week. And we think there is opportunity uh, for agreement uh, to deliver on uh, uh, on uh, relief to the American people. One quick question. Um, a judge this morning struck down the CDC's national moratorium on evictions. Do you have a response to that and the administration's plans? To appeal, I, potentially. Yes, I do. We understand, and this just happened, as you alluded to this morning, we understand the Department of Justice is reviewing the court's decision and should have more to say later today. Uh, we also recognize, of course, the importance of the eviction moratorium for Americans who have fallen behind on rent during the pandemic. A recent study estimates that there were 1.55 million fewer evictions filed during 2020 than would be expected due to the eviction moratorium. So it clearly has had a huge benefit benefit, but we would expect that a response and any, of course, decision about additional action would come from DOJ, and you may hear more from them today. Uh, go ahead, Christine. Thanks, Jen. Um, Facebook has decided to keep former President Trump off of its platform for now. Senator Ted Cruz tweeted the following, for every liberal celebrating Trump's social media ban, if the big tech oligarchs can muzzle the former president, what's to stop them from silencing you? What do you make of that comment? Does he have a point? Well, let me first say that um, this is an independent board's decision, uh, and uh, we're not going to have any comment on the future of the former president's social media platform. That's a decision that uh, it sounds like the independent board punted back to Facebook to make in the next six months, as I know you all have reported. Um, the president's view is that um, the major platforms uh, have a responsibility uh, related to the health and safety of all Americans uh, to stop amplifying untrustworthy content, disinformation and misinformation, especially related to COVID-19, vaccinations and elections. And we've seen that over the past several months. Broadly speaking, I'm not placing any blame on any individual or group. We've seen it from a number of sources. Uh, he also supports better privacy protections and a robust antitrust program. So his view is that there's more that needs to be done to ensure that this type of misinformation, disinformation, damaging, sometimes life-threatening information is not going out to the American public. You're saying more that needs to be done. Are there any concerns, though, about uh, First Amendment rights? And where does the White House draw the line on that? Well, look, I think we are, of course, a believer in First Amendment rights. I think what the decisions are that the social media platforms need to make is how they address the disinformation, misinformation, especially related to life-threatening issues like COVID-19 and vaccinations um, that have, are, continue to proliferate on their platforms. I want to ask you also, Jen, about police reform. President Biden said he wanted it done by the first anniversary of George Floyd's mm -hmm. death, May 25th. Is he confident that Congress can meet that benchmark? Where do those negotiations stand? 
Well, the negotiations are between members of Congress. So, uh, and he, uh, of course, is confident in the those discussions and the work that is happening under the leadership of everyone from Congresswoman Karen Bass to Senator Cory Booker, obviously Senator Tim Scott, who he called out in his uh, speech uh, just last week. And we are uh, we we remain uh, we are in close touch uh, with, of course, uh, negotiators and kept abreast of their progress. Uh, but we will wait to see what comes out of those discussions. If you do the math, though, this puts police reform in some regard ahead of the negotiations, one would think, for the American Families Plan, the infrastructure plan, which he set an end of the summer deadline for. Is this now the president's top priority? Does he want Congress to tackle this first? Well, I would say that the president believes uh, Congress can and should move forward with multiple uh, policies at the same time. And uh, certainly, that, that is what is happening on Capitol Hill. Uh, you know, those members who are playing central ro roles in these negotiations, and obviously they can speak to the frequency of the discussions and the status of them, and we defer to them. Uh, they will be important participants, of course, in any outcome of negotiations around the American Jobs Plan, but those negotiations can happen simultaneously. And just, just finally, Jen, how does he see his role? I mean, he's the one making this call to get this done. Has he reached out to Tim Scott, the person who's leading the charge on the GOP? I don't have any calls uh, or engagements to read out to you, uh, but I can say that, as you know, a number of representatives of the families were here just last week meeting with some senior members of the White House leadership. Uh, the president has talked about how it's long overdue to uh, put in place uh, police reform measures, that that will help rebuild trust in our communities. He uh, used his joint session speech, the highest profile moment uh, in, a first, in a president's first year, to talk about that and make the case. And uh, But the negotiations are happening between members of Congress. He feels that's the appropriate place for them to be, and we will continue to uh, use opportunities to call for this moving forward. Uh, go ahead, Kristen. Uh, Kristen. 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 I got confused. Caitlin. There's a lot of K's. It's a Wednesday. Go ahead, Caitlin. Right. Kristen and I also have been dressing a lot lately, so it's fine. Not today. Kristen um, has a very good mask on today. This Kristen. Both of your masks. Go ahead. Okay. My question is on these restaurant funds. Yes. When will they start being awarded, and does the president envision having to ask Congress for more money for this? Well, on the second piece, um, well, first, the first awards as part of the pilot program will be funded Friday. Right. So we're this program, not the pilot, the the, sec, the actual part of it, not the pilot. Well, those who applied this week uh, can expect up to uh, up to 14 days on average from submission to funding. So it'll be a very rapid turnaround. Okay, and does he envision asking Congress for more money for this? When Congress comes back, we are happy to discuss the best ways to further support small businesses, including restaurants hurt by the crisis. So he's certainly open to that. And as I noted, there has already been a large interest in this program, um, and uh, there are great needs across the country from these small businesses, from these restaurants that are uh, uh, in communities across the country. So we will we are happy to have a conversation with Congress about that. Okay. And my question on the patents, you were talking about how the president last summer expressed his favor for waiving these so countries would be able to mass produce these vaccines once they're ready. Of course, that was when they were not ready yet last summer. Yeah. So just to be clear, is that still his position? That has been that has been his position. He also believes that there needs to be an internal policy process. That's what's been ongoing. The recommendation, the appropriate process, the recommendation to come from uh, the USTR, uh, and then any announcement about a decision would come from USTR. And that's how government should function and should work. And as uh, and I noted in response to Andrew's question, there are of course considerations, uh, but we're also uh, in the midst of a global pandemic, and we are our objective is to getting uh, as much supply uh, out into the global community as, as quickly as possible in the most cost-effective manner as we can. But what did he communicate to Catherine Tai, his trade representative, before these meetings with the WTO on this are underway? Well, there have been discussions happening here uh, in a, on, through a policy process. I don't think his comments he made last summer are a secret. Um, they're certainly not. Uh, but again, he's a believer that you need to have all parties at the table, everyone providing information, hearing details, pros and cons of every decision. Uh, and that's exactly what he asked for from his policy teams. So given what he's heard from the policy teams, from the health experts, people like Dr. Fauci have weighed in publicly about whether this would be helpful mm -hmm. in making vaccines right now or if that would be further down the road, but is, is his position still what he said last summer, which is absolutely positively, he will ensure there are no patents standing in the way of other countries and companies mass producing these life-saving vaccines? 
That has been his position, but he is the President of the United States who believes in the advice, the counsel, the considerations of his policy teams, uh, and that has been the process that's been ongoing over the last several weeks, and I expect we'll have more to say quite soon. It's also important to note, just, uh, just in response to one of the things you said, that uh, this is not, this would not be, this is about the U.S. position. There would be an entire process at the WTO that would be likely be months uh, in the making. Uh, and that's just how the process works. So there's also a consideration leading up to that. Okay, thank you. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Jen. Uh, yesterday you said that the CDC engaged with around 50 stakeholders when coming up with these guidelines for reopening yeah. schools. So in addition to the teachers union, the American Federation of Teachers, who are these other roughly 50 stakeholders? Well, let me give you... I'm not going to read all 50, you know, but and I'm happy to send them to you after. Um, but just as an example, while I find this lengthy list, um, you know, they include the YMCA, they include um, the Council of Chief State School Officers, the National Association of School Nurses, the National Governors Association, Big Cities Health Coalition, Autism Speaks, Council of Great City Schools. Uh, so there's a range of organizations. And as we were talking about yesterday, the objective is to have a better understanding of implementation, uh, how it would work, and ensure that these guidelines can be implemented and they would not provide harm to the communities that they would be impacting. But can you just explain maybe just a little bit more, you know, why the CDC needs all of this input from so many outside entities? Why can't it just come up with these science-based guidelines on its own? Well, they do so to ensure that the recommendations are feasible to implement and that they adequately address the safety and well-being of individuals the guidance is aimed to protect. And that type of consultation is pretty standard as a part of their consideration processes. One other topic. Sure. Right now there is a huge Chinese rocket in outer space that's going to be crashing down to Earth likely on Saturday, and nobody knows exactly where. It'll likely be in an ocean, but it could, or pieces of it could come down over a populated area, and this isn't the first time that China has allowed, knowingly allowed, something like this to happen. So does the White House condemn this kind of repeated reckless behavior from China's space program? Well, let me first say that U.S. Space Command is aware of and tracking the location of the Chinese Long March 5B in space. Uh, and obviously the Space Command would have more specifics on that tracking and, uh, and additional details. Uh, the United States is committed to addressing the risks of growing congestion due to space debris and growing activity in space. And we want to work with the international community to promote leadership and responsible space behaviors. It's in the shared interests of all nations to act responsibly in space to ensure the safety, stability, security, and long-term sustainability of outer space activities. So cooperation is a hallmark of our approach. We're going to work with our international partners uh, on that, uh, and certainly uh, addressing this is, is something we'll do through those channels. And just a quick follow-up. If this rocket does cause some, some serious damages here on Earth, would the White House enforce China paying some sort of compensation as required by the UN liability, space liability convention? Well, um, again, I, I think we'd have, of course uh, refer to the advice and uh, guidance from U.S. Space Command and Department of Defense and others, uh, but we're not at this point. Uh, we are certainly tracking its location uh, through U.S. Space Command, and uh, hopefully that's not the outcome that we are working through. Okay. Go ahead, Eli. Uh, thanks, Jen. Um, I'm just interested if you have any response to some of the moves made this week by a few Republican governors to uh, get rid of, you know, protections that were in place for people, public benefits, also public health restrictions, uh, basically sending the message that the pandemic is over and sort of uh, criticizing Washington, the CDC, uh, the bureaucrats, as Ron DeSantis put it, for telling people they still need to wear masks indoors, uh, those sorts of things, saying that the vaccines have worked. Um, how are you trying to thread that needle? By celebrating the progress of all the people who have been vaccinated and keeping these things in place and also trying to keep people from viewing this through a political lens. Any outreach to any of these Republican state officials about the message they're sending uh, and any response to them from the podium? Sure. Well, first, um, we not only do a regular a governor's call every single week um, with governors from across the country, from red states and blue states, to talk about implementation, any changes we're making to allocations, as we talked about just yesterday. Uh, but we also have regular engagement with governors and local officials about uh, where the public health guidance is going, uh, questions they have, and even sometimes challenges they have in 
their communities. Our position from the federal government continues to be that the public health guidelines are in place to keep people safe, uh, not just governors and leaders of states, of course, but people in communities, families, kids, people who are in vulnerable populations, and that uh, we'll continue to communicate that from the federal level, even as governors are pulling back uh, their implementation in some places where it might be premature. As you, the president yesterday was talking about transitioning from the mass vaccination centers largely in urban and suburban areas and trying yeah. to really be more deliberate, um, proactive about getting the vaccine to people in outlying areas, rural areas. Uh, is there any concern about having enough vaccinators uh, to reach people in those areas? Will this mostly be run through local pharmacies or is there going to be a similar effort to uh, authorize different people in sort of medical fields? to be able to administer vaccines? Well, we did take that step uh, some time ago to expand the um, type of individuals who are qualified to be vaccinators, because early on we recognized that it wasn't just about supply, it was also about locations. And obviously, as you alluded to, we've made some changes and adjustments, uh, but also about vaccinators and ensuring that a larger group of individuals, dentists, veterinarians, others, could uh, also be eligible to uh, do the vaccine and get into people's arms because we want to ensure that in a range of communities across the country, there's a range of options for people who can do exactly that. Uh, so that's not a concern that uh, we are tracking at this point in time, a lack of, because we did a lot of work preparing uh, for those needs. And I would say that, um, you know, there were some mass vaccination sites we opened even last week, but what we announced yesterday is a kind of a phased approach based on the phase we're in uh, at this point in time, which is uh, that we are recognizing the daily numbers will go down a bit because we're at a such a high percentage rate relative to where people thought we were at this point in the pandemic. And we know it will be harder and harder to reach people and meet people where they are. Hence the increase, as you suggested, in walk-in hours or the announcement of walk-in hours on mobile units, on partnerships with primary care physicians and doctors to make it even easier and more accessible for people to get the vaccine. Just one more on, on tomorrow on the trip to Louisiana. So far, the president has mostly traveled to states that are, you know, competitive swing states. Louisiana is obviously a red state, but has been impacted by COVID. Except for Texas and Ohio. <laughs> well, okay. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, there's been a lot of travel to some of these states. Can you just talk a little bit about the, the takeaway that people should have when they see the president showing up, uh, you know, in deep red Louisiana tomorrow and the issues that he wants to to draw attention to? Sure. Well, first, the president, when he was elected, uh, knew from day one he was going to govern for all Americans, and that was going to be his objective. And so even if it's for people who didn't vote for him, for states who didn't vote for him, his uh, focus is on delivering for them. So tomorrow, uh, he'll make two stops in Louisiana. Uh, his focus will be on talking about the American Jobs Plan and how that plan, uh, in a historic investment in infrastructure, rebuilding the type of bridges, roads uh, in Louisiana that are long overdue to be upgraded, could help uh, not only people's travel and commutes, uh, but also create jobs in these communities. And uh, it's not about just delivering for people who voted for him or people who uh, have uh, blue check marks next to their name because they're Democrats. And that's uh, part of what this message should send, this visit should send. Go ahead, Hans. Uh, I get that you sort of prefer the Moody's model over the Penn Wharton. I'm just curious if the White House is gonna accept whatever CBO and JCT scores the president's proposals at. Well, I think our issue with the Penn Morton model was the data it was based on and that it was off. Uh, and so we'll have to look at what the data uh, that any future analysis is based on, and then we'll give an assessment. Okay, so even official, you're not embracing what an official assessment will be from CBO and JCT? Well, Hans, there is no assessment at this point in time. Our assumption is that they would be abiding by accurate data, so we'll look forward to seeing those assessments. And when do you expect those assumptions and data to come in? I don't have a prediction of that. Thank you. I suggest you ask them. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, does President Biden agree with Governor Whitmer's decision on the oil and gas pipeline? She's citing essentially water quality issues. Uh, it's, it's really angered Canada. Does President Biden agree with that decision? Uh, I'd have to take a closer look at the pipeline. I mean, we have been evaluating in a case-by-case -case scenario. Which, which pipeline are you talking about? The Enbridge. The Enbridge one. Uh, 
we look at each pipeline uh, through the prism of the impact on the environment uh, and also the impact on the economy, uh, and we make assessments. So I'd have to talk to our team if that assessment's been concluded or not. Okay, and, and the president's going to be talking about implement, implementation later. Mm -hmm. What sort of oversight uh, plans are, are being talked about as far as the spending and making sure it's... For the restaurant program or just the programs in general? In general, in general. Inspector generals, I mean, can you give us an, a, an idea of what sort of oversight is being talked about? Well, first, uh, the president uh, came into this job having served uh, as the person overseeing the implementation of the American uh, Rescue and Recovery, uh, the ARA, ARRA, uh, back in the early days of the Obama-Biden administration. He takes waste, fraud, and abuse incredibly seriously. And we have put in place uh, changes and reforms to programs at SBA and other programs that, that have been implemented where we've seen um, incidents of that in the past. Um, it's also why he has somebody, Gene Sperling, overseeing uh, the American Rescue Plan implementation to ensure there is coordination across government, that we are tracking uh, where we see issues. Uh, and certainly, uh, he's somebody who welcomes oversight and wants to do everything we can to reduce any waste, fraud, and abuse in these programs. And just finally, I wonder if the president or anyone else in the administration uh, spoke with the Treasury Secretary yesterday, given uh, some of her remarks that she uh, then sought to clarify. Well, the secretary herself uh, addressed her remarks later in the afternoon, so I'm not aware of any calls yesterday. Um, she will be here in the briefing room, and they'll have their regular economic briefing on Friday. Go ahead in the back. So I want to talk about climate for a second. Um, the president had said in his executive order in January um, that he would call for a green procurement plan for the federal government, mm -hmm. and part of that was about buying electric cars. The deadline for that plan was April 27th. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the status of it is and why the delay? Uh, I don't have an update on the status. It is something, as you noted, he talked about early administration. He is absolutely committed to, but I'm happy to check with our team and see where our uh, report on that lives. And um, I also want to ask, does the Biden administration have a timeline at this point for issuing pardons and commutations? Uh, I don't have any uh, previewing of that to provide, and probably won't from here. Uh, go ahead in the back. Uh, Yes, is the Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti un under active consideration to be the ambassador to India or any other country? I don't have any personnel announcements or assessments to make here uh, from the podium, uh, but hopefully we'll have some more formal announcements on ambassadors soon. And uh, the Tokyo Olympics are 12 weeks out. Mm -hmm. At what point does the president need to make a decision about his attendance? His attendance? Yes. And, his, and what factors are delaying the announcement? Well, I think the president uh, and his team uh, assess any invitation uh, as it comes in, but 12 weeks is some period of time. I don't have any up updates or predictions on whether or not he'll travel or uh, accept the invitation made to attend the Olympics. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Uh, two questions. First, on uh, the large sports arenas that are beginning to allow uh, for fully vaccinated fans in special sections. Uh, both uh, City Field and Yankee Stadium in New York have made mm -hmm. those announcements, and I know there are some others. Does the administration think that that is a good approach for uh, sports teams to take, uh, and maybe other large event venues? And are there any concerns about uh, equity when it comes to access to facilities if particularly those that were built with some public money in some cases, I'm sure, uh, when it comes to people who may not have been able to get vaccinated yet? Well, first, everyone in the country is eligible to be vaccinated, and certainly at this point in time. Uh, so we are, and we, as we've noted here, have taken a range of steps to ensure we are meeting people where they are, getting these vaccine doses out to communities around the country. Uh, in terms of an assessment of the safety of this approach by sports teams, I, I'd have to talk to our COVID team about that. Uh, and I think it's unlikely we're going to be weighing into every private sector decision about uh, how they're uh, moving forward uh, once people are vaccinated. But I will check with them uh, on that. Okay. And then the other the other question, if I can follow up on the uh, the debt limit question just a little bit. Sure. Has there does the does the president have a position on whether or not the debt limit itself should exist? at all, considering every, every you know, couple of years we go through this question of 
what are the extraordinary measures and how much extra time do we have? And we know at the end of the day that it's going to have to get raised or else we're going to have some sort of economic calamity. Uh, does the president have a view on the question more broadly of whether or not there even should be a debt limit? Well, first, raising or suspending the debt ceiling doesn't authorize new spending. It merely allows Treasury to meet obligations that Congress has already approved. Right? Uh, it has been the case for many years, um, and there have been bipartisan votes to support. Um, so, you know, the president does believe that Treasury should be able to meet its obligations and believes that Congress should move forward in a bipartisan manner, as they have historically in the past, including three times during the prior administration. Go ahead in the back. Uh, thanks. Um, on the G7 trip, um, mm -hmm. is there any advance on whether the president will meet with the Queen? And uh, separately, um, has the President or the First Lady been in contact recently with Prince Harry? Uh, I don't have any more trip details. Um, who among us wouldn't want to go see the Queen? Uh, but I don't have any details to preview at this point in time. I expect as we get closer to the trip, we'll have more specifics. Um, and uh, I don't have any calls or engagements uh, with Prince Harry or uh, Meghan Markle to uh, to read out for you with the President or the First Lady. On follow-up, is, is there a timeline on an announcement for the British ambassador? A timeline? I don't have a timeline for that. Any names or any, anyone on the consideration? No names to float out there for you. Uh, hopefully we'll have some more ambassadors soon to soon. announce. When Great. you say soon, will that be before or after he makes his decision on going to the Olympics? <laughs> I can't order for you, Hans. There's just so much excitement to stay tuned for around here. So we'll see. Okay, thanks everyone.